What do you do when you feel sad? I will often visit family, put the kettle on, or indulge in one of my favorite games as a way to emotionally detox. One franchise I always love returning to before the existential crisis sends me on a one-way trip to the bottom of a bottle is the Atelier series by the Gust Corporation. I started with the Arlen trilogy and slowly worked my way up, and everything about them just makes me feel relaxed and comfortable. Now, whilst the Arlen trilogy has a special place in my heart, I can't call any of them favorites. In fact, whilst I call myself a casual fan of the games, I can't call any of them particularly mind-blowing. Mainly due to the fact that they pump out these titles every year in an effort that would make Game Freak blush. Often feeling more or less the same, but with a few tweaks here or there. But don't get me wrong, this isn't an inherent negative. And part of the reason why I liked them so much were because of their simplicity and the fact that they knew exactly what they were trying to be. They work very well as nice, bite-sized JRPGs and returning to them is akin to bathing in a bubble bath surrounded by scented candles. You don't always need one, but when you do, it's nice. It's just nice. Anyways, enough with the analogies. Atelier Riser, Ever Darkness and the Secret Hideout, The Return of the King, is the brand new 21st entry into the Atelier franchise, and from the research I made before playing it, it seemed to be more of the same. Which definitely wasn't a bad thing. Now whilst I can be upfront and say that the game isn't perfect, it does come with baggage here or there, I was still completely surprised when it would somehow become one of the best JRPG experiences I had this year. It is such a nice feeling watching the franchise take a small step into making a dent on its niche status. So before we dive into why it resonated so hard with me, I've got to explain a little about the previous games and what they did for the most part. Jump to this time code if you want to skip the history lesson, 3, 2, 1. Now, the Atelier series started off on the PS1, back with Atelier Marie, way back in May 1997. Final Fantasy was releasing everyone's timeless wife, and the innards of Chris Packets were being turned into fine crumbs trying to find these fucking things. Marie was followed by Ellie, or Ellie, I'm not entirely sure, in 1998, and Lily in 2002, marking the series' first proper jump onto the PlayStation 2. These three games would be known as the Salberg Trilogy, and this is a pattern which would repeat all the way up to the PS4. There's the Gramnad duo, the Iris Trilogy, the Mana duo, Arland, Dusk, Mysterious, and finally, we land at Riser. One of the great parts of these duologies or trilogies is the fact that you can jump in whenever you want. Each game simply introduces a brand new character on the same region the game story is set in. But older characters can sometimes appear for a cameo or return as a playable character. I started my Atelier adventure off with Totary and never touched Rorona, and didn't find myself getting confused by past references. The other things the Atelier games would do around the Arlen trilogy and onwards were time limits. For example, in Atelier Totary, taking part in battles and gathering would waste hours in a day, slowly edging you closer to a series of deadlines, and I'll be blunt, even though these limits were extremely fair, so long as you're good at time management, they were my least favorite parts, and even put me off Totary when I first picked it up. Now, the time limit is hard baked into these games, and I eventually did get used to it when I picked it back up. But for a lot of people, seeing the words time limit will make them sweat more than I did when I first saw Melanie step into the gym as if Game Freak are weaponizing MILFs in an organized attack against me. Never this hand again. I understand the stress that this looming limit can put on a person. Ironic for a series which I have stated calms me down. I think it was the methodical act of completing orders on time in a cute environment that actually declutters my brain a bit. Who knows? I think for those people who really do despise these time limits, you'll be very happy to hear that ever since around Atelier Chalie, the time limits are virtually no more. Riser is one of these, so you can breathe easy. And I would argue that because of this, we have finally reached a comfortable middle ground for all parties. You can engage in as many battles as you choose, you can gather until your bags are full instead of, for example, Totary, who will stare at a patch of grass for five hours to slowly pick a fucking weed. And the comforting warmth that radiates from this series is ever present. Yet somehow, it would also present a battle system that I found so enjoyable on a personal level that I didn't run from a single fight, and a crafting system which made me weak at the knees. But before we jump into that, I'll try to give a 
quick rundown on the kind of stuff you'll be seeing in the story, and the characters you'll be meeting. I promise to do my breast. Okay, I put it in the mail. Can I have my check now? Check please! <laughs> Rizalyn Stout, known to her friends as Riza, is a farmer's daughter, living in a secluded but tightly knit village on an island called Kirken. Along with her two childhood friends, Lent and Tau, they go off on secret adventures on the mainland which according to the local police force is strictly verboten. But Riza has been bitten by the Luffy bug, where adventure and discovering new things has been woven into her DNA, and her friends just kind of join her for the ride, fighting monsters for the very first time and taking tiny baby steps into the outside world. On their first real adventure into the pixie forest, they hear a young woman scream and come rushing to her aid, taking down the monster and introducing themselves to Claudia. But maybe due to overconfidence, they're taken down by an overgrown rat shortly afterwards. Rat gang rise up. Now they are of course rescued by the people who are meant to be protecting Claudia, Empel and Leela. Empel being an alchemist and Leela being a no-nonsense warrior. It's here where Ryza sees something which will push her need to know beyond its limits, as she witnesses something so beautiful and so utterly mesmerizing that it convinces her to follow her new career into alchemy. Yeah, I'm not fucking with you. This is it. This is all she needed. The world's smartest dummy. Yaha! Claudia! Asobinikitayo! Really, bitch. Now, the story in general is sadly one of the weaker parts of Riser. Whilst it isn't bad by any stretch of the imagination, I'd say I only like the first half before the major threat is properly introduced. Now, in most Atelier games, you are not a traditional JRPG protagonist. You are, for all intents and purposes, a regular person. And the stories would tend to accommodate for that, making them feel more like a slice of life anime with gameplay thrown in. And whilst this can still be said for Riser, they do decide to throw in a a bunch of ancient evils which only intimidated me when Empel and Leela would simply allude to them being a thing. When you actually see one and they look like a fucking lizard with a delicious Malwam rock cluster stuck to its back, I felt myself physically deflate. It feels like two stories thrown into one. On one side you have an ancient evil threatening the safety of the village, and on the other hand you have a story based on community politics where the main antagonists are quite literally boomers and xenophobes. They don't understand the youth, you see. I'm so Sorry, Ryza, but no means no. I don't know what this alchemy is, but you already own a PlayStation and you don't need another one. That's not what alchemy is, Mom. And for the last time, it's called an Xbox 360. You have no idea what you're talking about. Playbox? <laughs> and if I'm honest, I felt more genuine hatred and loathing towards this character than I did any of the creatures that the game tried to push as the threat. Something this boy, Boss, does later into the game had me audibly call him a slimy little cunt. Rascal! Because despite everything the main party do to help him out, he still does one of the most petty acts of revenge I've seen in a hot, hot while. And seeing the village blame Empel and by extension Alchemy for all of the village's problems simply because they are both foreign and different made my blood boil. That's not to say that every member of the village is like this, however, as evidenced in the quests that you can pursue. Now, whilst these can be simple fetch quests, the developers decided to scale back on the quantity, allowing for each quest to give you character moments with the village members. It really makes this place feel like a proper community, where everyone knows each other's names and some have lives outside of simply handing you a quest to kill five boars. It's definitely wholesome and gives me that cozy feeling the Atelier games are known to give me. And before I move on, I totally forgot about this in my original draft, the personal quest and achievement system they have in this game is fantastic. By completing these, you can actually unlock passive abilities for your characters, and each character has specific categories they need to accomplish. Claudia is a merchant, so she needs to make money or help out villagers. Tao is a bookworm, so filling out your bestiary will make him more powerful in battle. It's a wonderful system, and the in-game benefits you get from it make these goals worth chasing after after in battle and the village itself. And on the topic of the village, I have no idea who was responsible for doing the Switch port of this game, but damn does it look good on here. I've heard mixed reviews of the PC port, but I'm definitely not your guy for that. The quality barely dips when you take it onto handheld mode, and for the most part, the character models and environments look pretty damn nice. We've come a long way from the plastic looking Switch environments from Lydia and Suelle, but that's not to say everything looks fantastic. You can see that with the limited budget that they had, 
they needed to take some shortcuts here or there. Those being the gathering points and some monster designs. There are a noticeably small number of monster designs in this game, and the ones they do use expect to see them a lot with a different coloured skin. The textures on some monsters aren't exactly fantastic either. The series staple, the Poonie, ironically having one of the worst ones. And that brings us onto the gathering points. Just look at the contrast between the pretty nice looking environments and the PS1 tier quality on the apples and trees. Like I really don't know how much it costs to make an apple shaped apple, but there has to be a better alternative than this. Actually, whilst gathering footage from Lydian Sewell, I noticed the same goddamn apple like I was confronting an old nemesis. But as I said, limited budget does mean shortcuts here or there. The Atelier series has never been an overly expensive series to make, especially considering that in 2019 alone there have been two more titles titles added to the roster. Well, with a release schedule like that, you'd expect Gus to be rolling in mountains of cash right now, right? But by the sounds of it, that really isn't the case. As I said earlier, this is a very niche franchise, and they need to make Atelier games at this rate or they will simply die as a company. The series director flat out admitting it in an interview. So, no wonder they reuse assets as much as they do. I feel sorry for them, needing to rely almost exclusively on niche sales just to survive. And I hope that Ryza's apparent success, for an Atelier game, can give them even a tiny bit of breathing room to work on making even more high quality models. I think if my complaints in the graphic department boil down to, I'd like to see some rounder apples in the next game please, then, you know. Don't get me wrong, I'd like to see them improve on this, but when everything else is looking pretty damn great for an Atelier game, then I can absolutely count the positives more than the negatives in this department. Speaking of positives, here we go! Let's get into the two major parts of Riser which turn this from a regular Atelier title into something which I'd consider a contender for at least one of my Game of the Years. Gameplay in an Atelier game has always been a fairly standard turn-based affair. Let's just say that if you played a JRPG before, you'll know what you're getting into. Atelier Riser switches things up a bit, putting in an ATB system which makes it feel more like a Grandia game than anything else. Being able to switch between active party members with a simple click of L1 or R1, and the tech the game gave to me made it so I wasn't bored once in my 30 plus hours worth of playtime. This only made stronger by the fantastic music that plays throughout the battles and the game itself, giving off that traditional JRPG sound whilst mixing in some blue reflection here or there. And trust me, any whiff of blue reflection soundtrack is a definite positive. So the most important thing to start off with is your AP. AP are points that allow you to use abilities. However, your AP in Riser is shared between each of your party members, so you need to make sure you raise it by using regular attacks. Your allies being controlled by the AI will do a great job at this by themselves. These regular attacks can be doubled, tripled, quadrupled, etc. by maxing out your AP and dumping all of it into your tactics bar with a button prompt. Now you can time your attacks with this flash in order to execute multiple basic attacks on the same turn. That's not all. You see these in the top left. In most cases, these look more like suggestions from your party members that you'd usually choose to ignore. But not in this game, obligatory finger wag. These here are action orders. Once you do what your party member asks of you, they unleash an order skill. Which is kind of like an ability, but doesn't waste any AP. Is that not enough? Do you crave more violence? Then wait until your enemy is enraged, press R2 or whatever equivalent you have, and initiate a quick action, where time will stop and you'll drain a large amount of your AP. But once you've used a skill, your party members will take off their leg weights and grab a fucking gun. This will cause both of your AI controlled teammates to unleash an order skill which is exclusive to the enemy's enraged ATB countdown. And you'll want to work fast in order to deplete their brain break gauge which will give you a very generous amount of time to slap them in the fucking brain. Ah, but wait! You've built up to this. You are now at tactics level 5. It's time to unlock your fifth gate and unleash your final ability. Fatal Drive is a ridiculously powerful super move, and considering how long it takes to charge, you'll probably only be seeing it during end game bosses. The move always felt like an accomplishment, as using it will deplete your tactics gauge all the way back to 1, so you'll have to rebuild your attack combos from scratch. Next up on the enjoyment segment of my brain is growing large and 
engorged, we come to the alchemy segment of the video, a staple in any atelier game. But in Ryza, they must have known what presses my serotonin buttons, and I'll be real, I get how this won't be everyone's cup of tea. But if you're a fan of talent trees, sphere grids, or anything in between, then you are going to love what I'm about to show you. Back in the good old PS3 days, alchemy was quite the basic mechanic. You gather materials, read recipes, slap the required materials into the cauldron, and bada boom, you're being crucified on a cross for witchcraft. What is this devilment I see before me? In Ryza, the initial steps into alchemy are pretty much the same. Gather the required materials and you're good to go. However, once you step up to the big bowl of glistening opportunities, a whole new world opens up to you. Virtually every single item that you create via alchemy has its own talent tree, sphere grid, whatever you want to call it, where you gather the required material, dump it into this tree, and make it even stronger. So here's how it works. Once you've created an item, either by manually selecting them or by autopiloting it, you will eventually have the option to rebuild your items. You do this with gems, which can be created when you get the ability to recycle your materials. Now you have access to your item's talent tree, I'm just calling it that from now on. You can now start piling up your materials into the designated slot to power up your item even more than your initial attempt. Quality will increase the damage and healing gain for certain items. Effects can give your item a myriad of new abilities, such as a healing potion, being able to resurrect allies, being able to gather even more materials with your tools, or even reaching previously blocked off paths pathways, where even rarer items can be found and even extra bosses here or there. And when you see this symbol next to a regular item, it means that there's an extra hidden recipe within, where you'll need to navigate the talent tree in order to find it, unlocking the item permanently onto your list once you've discovered it. This made venturing out into the world to discover materials a legitimately exciting time, and finding that rare one I'd been struggling to track down made me so happy as I scurried back to my atelier like a resource-hungry goblin knowing that I'd put in the work to make that discovery. Now this does bring up the issue of running back and forth a lot, which I understand can be a tedious process for some people. Thankfully, not far into the game, you'll be gifted with a fast travel ability which will allow you to travel virtually everywhere with the click of a button. Now, we are nearing the conclusion of this video, but I do have some other nitpicks or potential issues that need addressing, so I'll list them off nice and quickly now instead of leaving them out entirely. A nit is still a nit, end of the day. Having to jump into the item section of your journal to find out where a material is instead of labeling it on the world map was incredibly frustrating, and is something I I'd legitimately like to see patched in ASAP, considering other Atelier games have done this with no problems. Whilst it doesn't personally bother me, if you're someone who doesn't like repetitive noises in a game, consider turning off voices or you'll be gifted to a barrage of this. <laughs> Claudia's flute was distracting in combat as it clashed with virtually every battle theme and you cannot turn it off. No multiple endings! I loved those in previous Atelier games, and I'd love to see them back. And I feel if this game was in a fashion contest, it would come in last place compared to every other Atelier game. Not that it's a massive issue, of course, I just miss the intricate designs of other Atelier clothing. Empool probably being the only one to flaunt that fabulous dress code and give me the fashion souls I dearly craved. Other than that, well, I've already been careful to note down legitimate problems I have with the game. The nits have been picked so to speak. So, conclusion time. I get that in this video there are quite a number of grievances I have with the game, and it may not resonate with others as hard as it resonated with me, especially if the gameplay and alchemy sections don't click with you or fill in a particular niche that you've been missing. But all things considered, I can't deny the pure joy I had with Atelier Riser. Addictive gameplay in a 40 hour or so long JRPG with a deep, wonderfully fleshed out crafting system that never once left me bored. Irritations did arise with the negatives that I brought up, and I hope that in the next title, these issues are reviewed and worked upon. Because there will be another Atelier game just as certain as the Earth is round, unless it isn't. All I'm looking for now is even more polish and for those oversights to be fixed, and I'm sure whatever is coming up next will take Ryza's place as a series favourite. One thing can be said for certain though, 
And as for the Atelier series, is finally starting to see some big changes to its overall formula. And it's something that it's needed for around five games or so. And maybe with this, we'll start to see the series chip away at its niche status, being able to sit with some of the genre's more notorious giants, becoming a bastion of positivity and comfort for us all to enjoy. Hey everyone, thank you so much for reaching the end of the video. Please subscribe and click the bell if you want to see more of my work. My Patreon is down below if you really enjoyed what I do and you want to see yourself scrolling by on the right hand side. And if you want to see me continue to grow on this platform, then please consider sharing my content around. The algorithm has been pretty non-existent to me over the past few weeks and I'd appreciate any help I can get. Thank you very much if you can. On that note, it's time to thank some $5 plus patrons. Today, I'd like to give out some love to Ben. Bamboo Fighting, Andrew Blank, Hannah Peeler, and Lady Cerebellum. You're all a bunch of legends, and I'm directing all of my good vibes directly to your faces. Massive thank yous to the wonderful Valkyrie Aurora and Super Butterbuns for voicing Ryza and Ryza's mother. They did a fantastic job, and you can find their channels down below. Valkyrie has actually done some great Atelier vids herself, so go check them out if you're feeling the Atelier itch. And speaking of which, the Koei Tecmo US Twitter account. Whoever runs it put in so so much work to get me a code for this game, so I absolutely need to extend a very warm thank you to the lovely person who put in that work for me. Sylphie has hit it out of the park yet again with her little alchemist clemps, adorable work as always. Please go hit up her commissions and help support the artist. Thank you all again for watching, and I'll see you all next time.